Hello, and thank you once again for joining us for another Napa Temp, Napa Excellent Tech Talk session. The summer season is about to get underway, and in keeping with the season, today's topic is going to be about air conditioning. My name is Peter McCardle, and I will be a host for today's session. Uh, we will have some uh, slide content, and we also have some live on vehicle and um, some live demonstrations to share with you. So uh, let me go to my bench and uh, get our session underway. So a good part of our session today is going to be about electronically controlled variable displacement compressors. How they work, how they function, how to diagnose and test them. Uh, I actually have an on-vehicle, and on-car demonstration set up so we can really look at some scan data, some additional information and get a good understanding of how these uh, compressors work. But before we get underway, uh, let's take a look at some of the other topics that we're going to talk about in today's session. Um, you know, you've probably worked in some R1234 YF vehicles already, uh, but there are some new braking developments uh, relating to refrigerant, and it has to do with R134 retrofitting, more detail in a moment. As I mentioned, we're going to look uh, deeper at these electronically controlled variable displacement compressors, and we're going to wrap up the session uh, with some uh, additional service tips. Um, don't forget to go to NapaTemp.com. Top left corner there in the red box, you can enter the year, make, model of vehicle that you're working on. And of course, you can look up all the parts for it. But one particularly helpful piece is if you look over on the right hand side, uh, further up the screen there, there's another red box. It's, uh, and inside that box, it says lubricant. Well, if you look up the year, make, model of vehicle, now look down the bottom right, the, the red box in the bottom right, lower screen, uh, you can see that it's actually giving you the specification for the amount of refrigerant and oil that this, and the type of oil that this particular vehicle uh, calls for. So again, uh, very, you know, napatamp.com, uh, some really good information there, easy to look up. On the back over on the left side, about the very bottom of the screen, you can see another link for a video library. And so that there, if you click on that link there, that would bring us to the Napa Temp YouTube channel. And there's, we've got some really great videos up there on electronic leak, uh, leak checking, dye leak checking, flushing, uh, more information on these ECVD compressors. But one new video that we've just added is uh, for this tool over on the right hand side. It's uh, called a diagnostic sight glass tool. It enables you to take in the liquid refrigerant sample from the liquid line and really inspect it on a running working system. You can inspect the refrigerant for contamination, debris, uh, condition of the oil, is there dye present and so on. Uh, it's a really powerful tool and what's really neat about it is you know, you don't have to take anything apart. You can do all this with the vehicle actually running. And when you're finished with your inspection, you can very quickly draw the refrigerant sample back into the system. So again, uh, that's a brand new video. So just a couple of minutes long. Uh, take a look at that at NapaTemp.com. Uh, if you're getting your, under, you know, getting your air conditioning season underway, uh, we have, Napa Temp is a very nice uh, incentive for you here. If you install five Napa Temp AC kits uh, between June 1st and August 31st, uh, that will earn you a $100 Napa Temp uh, gift card. Uh, if you're a little bit more successful and you can install 10 Napa Temp AC kits in that same time period, that will get you a $250 Napa Temp gift card. So, Give it a go and uh, let's get some uh, free money here. Um, now, uh, you know, you can also, we, we do these tech talks occasionally. You can, if you, again, from Napa Temp, uh, NapaExcellent.com forward slash tech talk, you can see previously recorded uh, tech talks. Uh, this one will appear here within the next week or so. And also, you can register for any upcoming tech talks from this screen here. That's NapaExcellent.com forward slash tech talk. Now, so that should get us right into uh, the beginning of our session here. And we're, as you've probably heard, the, you know, if you buy a new vehicle today, uh, it's going to come with R1234YF. In other words, the transition from the old R134A to the new R1234F is just about complete. Every new vehicle today is coming with R1234F. It is a mildly flammable uh, refrigerant, but in general, if you, you know, if you follow fairly reasonable safe, safe practices in your shop, uh, it's perfectly safe to work with. I haven't heard, you know, it's been out there for 10 years now, and I haven't heard 
It's not saying that there hasn't been one, but I certainly haven't heard of any incidents associated with the flammability of R1234F. It's uh, quite safe to work with. Its pressure temperature profile is virtually identical to R134A. We'll look at that again in a moment. The, the downside is, and we'll discuss in a little bit more detail shortly, is it is chemically, the molecule is quite a, is chemically quite unstable compared to R134A, and that can lead to some surface issues, as we shall see. Um, the oil, it does call for heavy-duty PAG oil. Uh, the good news is that the new oils for R1234YF are backwards compatible with our old R134A systems if it uh, is the same viscosity. Uh, but you can't use, uh, just to reiterate here, you can't use uh, the old R134A PAG oils in a new R1234YF system. Now, the reason, of course, that this transition uh, is taking place is because of climate change or global warming, whatever you prefer to use. Uh, the old R134A had a global warming value of 1400, uh, whereas this new product is a global warming value, it's published value of four, but a new, more recent study has actually shown that its global warming value is actually less than one. So that's why we're moving from this uh, R134A to R1234YF. <coughs> now, the good news is, from a diagnostic and service perspective, is that the pressure temperature profile of these two refrigerants is virtually identical. You can see the blue line is R134A, the red line is 1234YF. And so if it didn't say R1234 OIF on the gauges, just looking at high and low side ga gauge pressures, you would never know whether you're working on an R1234 OIF or a 134A system. So that's kind of the good news from a diagnostic and service perspective. Now, I will, um, uh, th there are a few differences. Um, while most of the components are virtually the same and maybe even the same, uh, one big component here on the left side of the screen that you would probably notice on most, not all, but a great many R1234 RF uh, vehicles is this piece here over, over on the left hand side called an internal heat exchanger. And I will talk more about that in a moment. I have a cutaway that I will show you. Uh, in the middle there, of course, as I've already kind of mentioned, uh, the new refrigerant does call for a special oil. Uh, YFL or 1234YF oil. It has a special uh, chemical additive package. And uh, of course, the other difference is it's, it's really a difference in name only. As you can see here, there's a yellow decal there on the evaporator. In other words, evaporators intended for use in or 1234YF vehicles. They're supposed to be manufactured to a higher standard, uh, you know, more less likely to leak. Although I've talked to plenty of technicians and shops who said they've replaced dozens of these already, so they still do leak. Uh, but uh, the new evaporators will have a yellow decal on there. The decal must say it meets J SA J2842. Uh, it is illegal to take an used evaporator from another vehicle or from a junkyard and put it in uh, a vehicle. If you're replacing the evaporator in a YF vehicle, the evaporator must be new and it has to have that yellow decal on there. And of course, it's going to have uh, a decal under the hood that clearly indicates that the vehicle calls for R1234IF. However, this, to my mind, is the most significant difference between uh, servicing an R134A vehicle and an R1234IF vehicle. Uh, the atmospheric breakdown, in other words, the time it takes for the molecule of R134A to break down in the atmosphere is 13 years. And that's why it has, that. that's exactly why it has a global warming value of uh, 1400, because it persists for so long in the atmosphere. On the other hand, on the right hand side in the green here, you can see that R1234F breaks down chemically in just 11 days. And what that means, of course, is the YF molecule is much more chemically unstable, more reactive, if you like, uh, than 134A. And so a big issue with YF is you can get very rapid acid buildup in the, air, in the, in the system. And so you can, you know, you do the system, you do, you know, you replace a compressor, let's say, the thing blows nice ice cold air, but it comes back in two weeks or two months or 12 months even with a leak. 
because you've got rapid acid buildup in the system, corrosion, and next thing you know, you've got a leak in the condenser or the evaporator or something like that. So this is why it's very important to do a deep evacuation to get all the air and moisture out of an R1234IF system. And also critically important is you must use that uh, the YF dedicated oil because the, while it is still a base PAG, the oil itself is, itself is still a base PAG. It has a special um, chemical additive package to stabilize the chemistry in the system. So it's important to use the new oil with the YF refrigerant. The new oil, however, is you can use that oil if it's the same viscosity. Most of them are PAG 46. You can, you can use this oil in an older R134A system, but not vice versa. The service ports are a little bit bigger, but a one millimeter bigger, both the high and the low side service ports, but they're still the same old quick disconnect concept, very similar function uh, to a 134A system. I will recommend one thing to you, uh, is uh, you need a separate, uh, simple R1234F manifold gauge set because once you connect up, you, you, will, you haven't already experienced this, if once you connect a YF machine to a vehicle, now you're, you know, you're basically married to that vehicle for at least a half hour because the machine takes so long to go through its identification routine. It has to pull the hoses back into a vacuum before you can move on to the next vehicle or maybe even maybe move on to the next process. So for quick checks and quick diagnosis and to get a handle on what might be going on with the problem vehicle, I recommend having a YF manifold gauge set on the hand for quick tests. So this is the, the new uh, development here that uh, is just kind of breaking. Um, I, you may have heard that R134A has been phased down. It's not being banned altogether. It is just being phased down. It's already uh, to October, I think, of uh, 2021. Uh, it was set at production, was already uh, restricted to 90% of 2013 production. I think by later this year, it's going to be at 60% of 2013 production. And over the next 10 years, it's going to be phased down. By 2036, I believe the production of R134A is going to be at 15% of 2013 production. So as you might imagine, it's going to get very scarce and probably very expensive fairly quickly over the next several years. So for that reason, there are still millions of Warren 34A vehicles out there on the road. And so an alternative had to be found um, uh, to, you know, how are we going to service these older R134A vehicles if we can't get R134A refrigerant? <coughs> so there is uh, a submission to the EPA uh, under the SNAP program, the Significant New Alternatives Policy Program. There is a submission at max at the moment to approve R1234YF as a retrofit refrigerant in older 134A vehicles. Now, it hasn't been approved yet, but there is an expectation that it will happen this year. We'll just have to wait and see. There is another product called R456A. It's a tri, it's a blend of three refrigerants, one, two, three, four, ZE, not YF, ZE, about 49%, 134A, 45%, and another refrigerant called R32 uh, at 6%. And that is also, has also been submitted to the EP for uh, approval to use as a retrofit refrigerant in older R134A systems. Um, I'm not so sure um, it, um, you know, it's certainly, the, the, the advantage of that product is that you could top off the expectation is that because it's half or a significant amount of it is R134A, you could top off an existing R134A system. Um, with this um, th with this blend refrigerant, but that's what's going on at the moment. Uh, concerns I would have about retrofitting with YF is, you know, YF is a slightly less efficient refrigerant than 134A, so you might run into, it's got a very slight difference in pressure temperature profile. You might, uh, on a retrofit, you might run into efficiency issues, and also the performance of the thermal expansion valve might be a little bit different, so you might have to be thinking about uh, changing out the THC valve and possibly adding some kind of an efficiency improver, a better condenser or something, if you retrofitted a 134A vehicle with uh, 1234YF. But uh, we're in wait and see mode right now to see how all this uh, turns out. So uh, this is the, or, uh, there is also a, retrof a proposed retrofit refrigerant alternative for R1234IF. It's called R444A. 
And it, again, it's another blend of refrigerants. You see the blend uh, content here. And the whole idea here is that it's, uh, again, it hasn't been approved. It's at the EPA under the SNAP pro program, maybe approved later this year. And the whole idea here is just to have a less expensive alternative available. <coughs> Excuse me. A less expensive alternative for R1234F, which, as you know, is still quite expensive. So that brings me to, uh, you know, brings me back to our discussion of electronically controlled variable displacement compressors. Now, on a cart here, I've got a couple of these compressors uh, available. And, uh, you know, as the name suggests, electronically controlled variable displacement means that the pumping displacement of the compressor is completely computer controlled. <clears throat> And so um, if you look in the rear head of this compressor here, you can see that there is a solenoid, right? And this is a computer-controlled solenoid, and the computer can vary the pulse width command to this solenoid to control the stroke of the pistons. In other words, to control the pumping displacement of the pistons. And the whole idea of this compressor is it's much more efficient. In other words, I only run the compressor at the displacement that I need, at the minimum displacement that I need to meet the heat load in the system. When these compressors were inter introduced initially in the mid-2000s, let's say, a lot of European vehicles, Volkswagen, Mercedes, and so on, later uh, in the 2007 and later, a lot of Chryslers were the first to use this domestically. The, what's unique about the first iterations of these uh, electronically controlled variable displacement compressors is the first iterations were clutchless. Do you see that when I turn the poly here, the shaft, the crankshaft of the compressor is turning, uh, you know, anytime the poly is turning. So if the engine is running, this, the crankshaft of this compressor is turning. Now the displacement might be very small, uh, but the comp nevertheless the internal crankshaft in the compressor is turning. And if we look behind the poly here, you can see there's absolutely no clutch. So this is a clutchless, uh, what we call a clutchless design, electronically controlled variable displacement compressor. Uh, these, we get a lot of tech line calls here on our tech line. Uh, these are often misdiagnosed. And the reason is, if this solenoid is not getting a command from the computer to make the compressor pump, um, in other words, if you were to unplug the solenoid, this compressor defaults to minimum displacement, about 3%, 5% displacement. And so um, imagine that the, you know, if the computer thinks the engine is overheating or something of that nature, it will stop sending a command to the solenoid. So the misdiagnosis occurs when the technician looks down at the poly. I see that the compressor, I don't understand that it doesn't have a clutch yet, but it looks like the compressor is turning. And so if I see that the high side pressure is low and the low side pressure is high, the, uh, but the clutch appears to be turning, then a traditional diagnosis would be the compressor is no good. Of course, what I need to double check, and this is what we're going to check shortly now actually on a vehicle, I need to understand does this solenoid have a, is this solenoid getting a command from the computer? Now in later years, uh, some manufacturers uh, have introduced what we call um, have introduced a clutchless version of this compressor. So you see now when I turn the clutch, I can turn the poly, but the shaft, the crankshaft, the center, the compressor is not turning. So this compressor, it is an electronically controlled variable displacement, but it does have a conventional clutch. So when you turn, you know, the, if the computer sees an issue, in addition to shutting off the command to the solenoid, it can also shut off the compressor, uh, it can shut off the clutch completely, just like in a conventional compressor. So to get a better understanding of how these compressors work, I have an older technology here that actually works the very same way on the inside. So this is an older uh, GM V-series compressor. And as you can see, when I, you know, I've, I, can, I can turn it here, I can make it work. And do you see uh, right on the end here is a control valve. This is actually the displacement control valve. And um, this, is what, uh, this is what controlled this valve here. It's a pneumatic valve, controlled the pumping displacement of the compressor. So what I want you to see here, inside this compressor, there's a wobble plate. Later models, we call it a swash plate. And you can see this wobble plate, I can change the angle of that wobble plate, or that swash plate. And so you see, I've got it at a very steep angle here, the crankshaft. Now when I turn the compressor, do you see that the pistons are traveling back and forth quite a ways? In other words, there's a lot of uh, 
the, the, the pistons have a, 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 quite a long stroke. They're at maximum stroke. Well, watch what happens if I change the angle of that swash plate. Now I'm going to change the angle all the way. It's almost a right angle now to the crankshaft. Watch now when I turn the crankshaft. You can see that the pistons hardly move at all. So by changing the angle of that, <coughs> excuse me, by changing the angle of that swash plate, if I put it here in the middle, and now I turn it, you can see the pistons are not full stroke, but they're you know still pumping maybe 50%, something of that nature. So the way the fundamental, the 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 this old older technology here, it used a matic, a pneumatic control valve in the rear head of the compressor. Now the way this compressor worked, the old school uh, variable displacement compressor worked was this. If you look here, I've got this is the control valve that sits here on the rear head of the compressor. This valve, if you look, it's got a series of O-rings on here. It's actually got three separate sections. It's got a big section up here, it's got a center section, and it's got a, 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 another section here between these two O-rings here uh, at the narrow end of the valve. The way this works, there's a, a pneumatic bellows, a pressure-sensitive bellows inside the valve, and that uh, this area of the valve here between these two O-rings is exposed to suction side pressure. So uh, suction side pressure, of course, is a function of heat load. It's a function of how much heat load is on the system. If I turn the blower on to high speed, low side pressure is going to increase because it's absorbing more heat energy. That increased pressure will act on the pneumatic bellows inside, and it will move a rod, a pinthel, inside here. And so uh, that's how we control the pumping displacement of this compressor. By sensing suction side pressure, we can adjust the pumping displacement, the pumping output of the compressor. And the way this happens is this. The center section of the, of the valve here is exposed to crankcase pressure. In other words, this section of the valve is exposed to the area behind the pistons. Here's the top. This would be the, this is the top of the piston here. This section of the valve is exposed to the crankcase, the area behind the pistons. And the very tip of the valve, this area here, the very at the narrow end, is exposed to high side pressure. So I'm sensing suction pressure here, I'm exposed to crankcase pressure here, and I'm exposed to high side pressure here at the very narrow end of the valve. And the way this works is that I can, by by increasing, by bleeding pressure into or out of the crankcase of the compressor, I change the pressure difference across the pistons, and that way I can change the angle of that swash plate seamlessly, gradually, smoothly, on the fly to change the pumping displacement of the compressor to match the heat load in the system. The problem, of course, is that this compressor really has only one input. The only thing it can see or sense it, if you like, is suction side pressure. But imagine that I took out this electronically controlled solenoid and I replaced it with a computer controlled. I just took out the, the pneumatic solenoid and I replaced it with the computer controlled solenoid. Well, now it's a, now it's got, again, it's got a pintle inside. This is one I've taken apart here. You can see the there's the metering pintle inside the valve. But again, if you look at it closely, it's got the, it's got the th same three pressure sensitive areas, suction pressure, crankcase pressure, high side pressure. But now with the computer in control, it can look at high side pressure, ambient temperature, cabin temperature, low side pressure. Um, if it thinks the engine is overheating or anything of that nature, uh, with the computer in control, I can have much finer control over the pumping displacement of the compressor by changing the command to the solenoid. In other words, once the computer's in control, I can you know, really fine tune the command of the solenoid so I can much more precisely, much more exactly uh, control the pumping displacement of the compressor. Now, um, the other piece of the puzzle here is this is another iteration of this compressor. It's called a TSB19C. And I think you can see here, uh, I've taken the clutch off of it. This compressor does, I've taken it off just so we can see everything. This compressor does have a conventional clutch, so it can be engaged and disengaged. Uh, it does have the solenoid, the displacement control solenoid that I've just explained. So it's a variable, electronically controlled variable displacement compressor like we've discussed and explained. 
The pieces that, that you may not have seen before here is this piece here. This piece here is called a bat lock sensor. Um, and it's really just, it works, it's a VRS type sensor, it works just like a crank or a cam sensor. It is sensing, just like a crank sensor, it's measuring the compressor speed. So the computer knows how fast the engine is turning, now it sees how fast, it can see how fast the compressor is turning. There's an expected ratio between the engine RPM and the compressor RPM when the clutch is engaged. If the compressor starts to slip because it's seizing or high set pressure is too high or the belt is slipping, for whatever reason, uh, if the computer sees a discrepancy between engine RPM and compressor RPM, it can shut the clutch off to disengage the compressor to prevent damage to the belt and so you don't lose your power steering and so on. The other unique piece to this compressor is this piece here right on top. This is the discharge port here. Here's the suction port here. On the discharge manifold here, there is a sensor that we call a, um, this is called a refrigerant volume flow sensor. Uh, if we look closely at it, it's actually got uh, three wires. Whoops. In fact, I think I might have one on the side here. Let me just go ahead and grab it. So if we look here, here's the discharge port from the compressor that we were just looking at. And do you see there is a, an area here this is, this little piece here is the refrigerant volume flow sensor. This sensor does not make contact with the refrigerant. It's just clipped a, a snap ring here uh, that holds it to the outside uh, of the discharge manifold. And the way this works is it's got, just like a MAP sensor or TPS, it's got a five volt reference, a ground on the signal. And what it does, it, uh, it measures, what it's doing of course is it's measuring the volume, the refrigerant volume flow. In other words, it's measuring how much refrigerant is the computer actually flowing? How much is it pumping? And so if I know the compressor RPM, if I know how, com how, fat, how much refrigerant is pumping, I can much more precisely control the command that I'm sending to the displacement control solid. So again, it's all about efficiency, fuel economy, emissions, and so on and so forth. This sensor, the, what makes this sensor work is in underneath of it, inside the discharge manifold here, there is a, a little magnet, uh, like you can see here, there's a magnet, and that magnet is actually balanced between two springs, like, kind of like this. The magnet is balanced between these two springs. And so there's a, sh a little uh, shunt passage in here, and so when the refrigerant starts to flow, the little passage acts as a restriction and deflects that manifold to, to the left or to the right. And so the manifold, the magnet acts on the, this is a Hall effect sensor. It's, it works on a Hall effect uh, technology, Hall effect type of technology. As the little magnet moves, it generates a signal, a voltage signal, just like a TPS. It generates a voltage signal proportional to the volume of refrigerant flowing through the compressor. Just a quick tip here. Um, the voltage is, you know, as the voltage decreases, that indicates refrigerant volume is increasing and vice versa. As the, as the voltage of the sensor is increasing, that indicates that the refrigerant volume is actually decreasing. So that's that. And this here, uh, um, this is actually uh, a, a, an ECV compressor that I've taken apart. And you can see uh, the pistons. Um, you can see the pistons inside. Here's, I'll just take one out so you can see it right here. They're very light. Um, the other thing, and so as, as the duty cycle changes to this solenoid, this is the actual swash plate from a, a, a later design compressor. You can see it's double hinged here. So by changing the angle of that swash plate, I can change how far these pistons are dragged back and forth to control the pumping, to control the stroke, and therefore the pumping displacement of the compressor. So that is uh, that is ECV compressor. I should a good thing to point out here is these solenoids can you know some of the this is we're going to look at on the Vega. These solenoids can stick, so you you know the the or they can leak internally, pneumatically, they can leak internally, and the compressor doesn't either get stuck at a fixed displacement, doesn't pump as much as it should. Um, as you can see here, there's a double hinge right here. Well, some cheaper compressors, and you've got to watch out for this, you see this one here, it's actually noisy. This is just a sliding hinge. I've seen problems with these compressors where uh, it wears, you get a wear groove in the sliding hinge, and uh, they get stuck at an intermediate displacement, and so the customer complaint is on a hot summer day, uh, the air conditioning is not as cold as it should. So that is 
um, electronically controlled variable space and compressors. Now, the other thing I mentioned as we were getting the conversation, this is the oil I mentioned, this is the YF oil that you need uh, with, the, uh, with the U refrigerant, with the R1234F refrigerant. And the other thing I mentioned uh, as we, uh, in our introduction uh, was uh, this, the internal heat exchanger. So here is an internal heat exchanger. Here is the liquid line that would attach to uh, the condenser outlet. Uh, here is the suction line here, the big return to the compressor. On the other end, I'll just trace it through the camera here, I hope. On the other end, here is the suction line. Here's the liquid line arriving at the TXD valve. Here's the suction line coming back from the compressor. So the way this works is this. The refrigerant, liquid refrigerant leaving the condenser is still warm, probably 110, 120, 130 degrees. And so if you look, this is really the internal heat exchanger is really what we would call a double wall pipe. If we look inside here, I think you can see that it's just two pipes, like a, a pipe within a pipe. And so the liquid refrigerant flows in the area, in the narrow area. You can see this little passage is right there at the tip of my finger. It flows in the skin between the two pipes. The liquid refrigerant flows in the skin between the two pipes. The gaseous refrigerant, the cold gaseous refrigerant coming back from the evaporator, comes down the center of the pipe. So I'm using the cold gaseous refrigerant returning from the evaporator to take a few more degrees of heat energy out of the hot liquid refrigerant before it gets to the TXV valve. So this is how an internal, no moving parts or valves, uh, this is how um, an internal heat exchanger works. And the reason that we need these is because R1234F is slightly less efficient than R134A. So we need these internal heat exchangers to make up the difference um, between R134A and R1234F. So let's uh, go back to our presentation here for just a minute and um, uh, we'll go, go right on from there. So now let's, um, let's talk about how original compressors failed. Um, if you, you know, typically I'm gonna make this pretty quick. Uh, PAG oil and R134A, uh, they mix together well when they're both liquid, but inside the evaporator when the refrigerant evaporates, there's a very weak molecular bond between the YF, or sorry, between the R134A and the PAG oil. And so as the refrigerant evaporates, it tends to leave the oil behind. And the problem is that the red dotted line there, uh, all vehicles leak refrigerant over time. And as the liquid level in the evaporator gets lower and lower and lower, uh, what tends to start happening is the oil starts dropping out and pooling in the bottom of the evaporator. Now, um, refrigerant or 134 by itself is a powerful degreaser. It strips the lubricating film of oil from the compressor or the pistons and cylinder walls inside the compressor, and you get a fine microscopic abrasive debris sloughing off the pistons and cylinder walls inside the compressor. And so that fine microscopic debris will, tra will transition, will transit the entire system, uh, so it'll be coating the interior surfaces of every inch of the refrigerant path, but it will be particularly concentrated in the dirty oil and the oil that's been accumulating in the bottom of the evaporator. And so oftentimes, you know, when I drain old compressors, or even if you look at the waste oil bottle on the side of your, of your recovery machine, uh, it's, you, you, you've got this fine microscopic abrasive particulate that is literally distributed throughout the entire system after a catastrophic compressor failure. And therefore, for that reason, uh, when you, if you're replacing your compressor, if you want a comeback free, warrant, you know, no comeback, ice cold air repair, then you need to understand that if you're replacing that compressor, every inch of the refrigerant path should be either new or flushed, one or the other. So the question I'm often asked then uh, is, you know, hoses and lines, should I flush them or replace them? So I've got a couple of old hoses here that we can quickly take a look at. And I will just move my little demonstration samples out of the way. And you can see here, I've got an old hose assembly here, right? And you might think, well, why can't, couldn't I not flush these hoses? The problem with this hose assembly is there are, these are two mufflers. And this one is pretty empty inside, but this one here, as you can see, the line comes in, 
It goes all the way hard up, hard up against, sorry, hard up against the bottom of the can like this here. If you get debris into this muffler here, you ain't ever going to be able to flush it out. That's number one. So if hoses, have, you know, if manifold hoses have any kind of a muffler or filter in the line, you should replace them because they cannot be satisfactorily flushed. Now, um, if I look at, so here's a, a, you know, here's a hose set here, an older hose set here, and you can see that, uh, you know, there are no, ho there are no hoses, um, there are no mufflers in this, in, in, in either one of these hoses. So I could potentially flush them. Um, and I'm not against flushing hoses. However, when you consider that, um, you know, ru rubber is organic, oftentimes the micro leak that led to the low charge, oil dropout, no compressor lubrication, in other words, often the root cause of the original compressor failure is a micro leak at some of these crimps here, right? And if there's a, a leak here, you, especially if the compressor has a, you know, is cracked, you might, ne might not be able to leak check this crimp until you've, you know, flushed the system, put the whole system back together, and now at the very end, you get to leak check this, uh, this crimp. And of course, this particular hose set has at least four different uh, hose to metal, you know, rubber to metal crimps. So in my experience, when you count the cost of flush, your time to do the flush, the fact that you're often flushing an 8, 9, 10, 15 year old hose that you don't even know if it's leaking yet. Uh, seriously, if you often if you add up the cost of flush, your time to do the flush and compare it to the cost of a new hose assembly, it is often literally cheaper to replace hoses than to flush them. Another problem with hoses as they get older is the barrier can become permeable. So the whole entire surface area of the hose can leak or weep. And the, 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 the leak is so diffuse that using a conventional leak detector, you know, the, the leak is so minute at any one point that you might not even ever pick up the leak with a conventional electronic leak detector. So again, another reason to at least consider, I'm not saying that you should, but you should at least consider um, replacing um, uh, hose assemblies. So let's take a look at a couple of ways uh, that we could actually uh, test uh, one of this type of compressor on an actual vehicle. We have a, two, a 2015 Chrysler 200 here, 2.4 liter engine, and it's got, the, it's got an ECVD compressor, computer controlled displacement compressor, uh, and this one does have a clutch. Now, I have a scan tool plugged into it already, so we've got some live data here, and what I'm going to show you, this is, I'm using the bi-directional function on the scan tool. You can see at the very top of the screen here, electronically controlled variable displacement compressor, PWM, pulse with the modulated command. And um, I've, got, I've chosen a few PIDs. I, I'm showing the ECD, ECVD command, uh, that should be in percent. Um, evaporative temperature is 82 degrees, the engine is off right now. Refrigerant pressure is about 160 PSI. And the compressor command current, uh, there is about a half an amp, at least according to the scan tool, there's about a half an amp flowing in uh, the displacement control solenoid right now. And the pulse width command, just key on engine off as we're sitting here discussing, uh, is 53%. So if you look at the very, all the way very along the bottom of the screen, do you see that I can command, so this is the bi-directional function of the scan tool. I could command 0%, which should turn the solenoid off altogether. <coughs> And it apparently does. Um, now the next option here is 1,310.7 percent. Let me check. The, so let's before we before let me go back to zero. Let's go ahead and start the vehicle up. Let's start the engine up, and let's see what the scan tool will allow us to do. So I heard the compressor just click on, um, but you know we're commanding. You know, we're commanding zero current here, so obviously uh, there's no current in the solenoid. If I click on this second option here, 1,310.7%, and now my command current goes to 0.94 of an amp. Well, t t typically the resistance of these solenoids is about 10, 14 ohms. So, you know, 12 ohm solenoid at 12 volts is one amp. So right now, according to my scan tool, uh, refrigerant pressure is 246 PSI. And the, the pulse width command is 185%. Well, we all know that's impossible. The maximum command you can have 
uh, is 100%. So already my scan tool has given me some pretty confusing information here. <coughs> and the command current at 0.93 of an amp, in other words, almost a, a whole amp, would suggest that the solenoid is is actually running at about 100% command. So now let me go to 2621%. And again, uh, now the, the current is still at 0.9. Uh, the command pulse width modulated has gone to 113. Let me go to the next command option. Uh, now you can see the pulse width command is 143% when the maximum should only be uh, 100%. Uh, the current is still about the same, 0.9 of an amp. And so let me go right to the end here, cut to the chase. And now we see that the current, the command current has gone to zero and the pulse width command has gone to zero, even though I'm supposed to be, you know, by the schedule, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be choosing 6,553%. And so do you see that using the bi-directional function on this scan tool uh, to function test this compressor is kind of a bit of a waste of time. Um, it's so confusing. The data is unreliable. The commands are unreliable. I can't be confident that I'm really, um, you know, the, is, is there a problem with the compressor or is there a problem with my scan tool? So this is a very, you know, scan tools I'm, I'm finding are not always the best way to test these ECVD compressors. The other option I have is I actually have a manifold gauge set connected up to this vehicle. Let me just double check. So I've got this tool. I've got this tool here. I think you can see the pressure gauges and you can see this tool. So this is a tool. Uh, it interfaces between the vehicle harness <coughs> and the compressor solenoid. And the tool has three functions. Um, uh, the first one is the three functions. The first function is it's got a resistance check function. So if I hit this button here, you can see it right off the bat, it enables me to check the resistance of the ECVD solenoid. And I think you can see, I said the spec is typically 10 to 14 ohms at 12.3 ohms, uh, you know, pretty much right in the middle there. I'm satisfied, at least electrically, the solenoid appears to be okay. Now the other two functions on the tool, is you can see it's saying normal mode right now. <coughs> well, in normal mode, the tool would show me the actual pulse width modulated command uh, coming from the computer to the compressor, which of course should be somewhere between zero and 100%. Right now the AC is off and the command is, as you can see, the command is zero. So if we can go ahead now, let's, uh, now let's suppose that this vehicle came in with a problem. I connected up this tool. Obviously the air conditioning is not working. I connect up this tool and I can see that the command, as you can see, is zero. Well, the other option of the tool is I can go over to manual mode. So now I'm in manual mode and in manual mode, I can use the tool to command. I can actually take over the solenoid with the tool independent of the vehicle computer. And now if we watch our, I'm just gonna keep ramping up the command to the solenoid and let's watch what happens to look at the pressures on our gauges. You see that the low, price, low side pressure is starting to drop, high side pressure is starting to increase. So, in completely independent of the vehicle computer, I can confirm here that I've got a functioning compressor, that this system, that the basic refrigeration circuit and the compressor are both good. So right now, I just, this tool, the, the command from the tool tops out at about 84%. And the reason for that is we don't want to, you know, you wouldn't want to if you had a cooling fan problem or something of that nature, we don't want to build the pressure so high that it would vent refrigerant to the atmosphere. So we limited the command to 84%. But as you can see, my low side pressure is down around 30 PSI. My high side pressure, I think, is around, getting around 200. And it's about 70 degrees in the, shot in the studio here right now, so there's not much of a heat load. But right off the bat, you can see that this system, <coughs> the compressor on this vehicle, is actually working. So if I dial back the command, I think you can see the low side pressure is starting to increase. Look at it going up, high side pressure going down. So I'm pretty confident that this compressor is working, that the basic refrigeration circuit is okay. <coughs> so on this vehicle, with this information alone, 
I know I need to look at the computer. I need to plug in my scan tool. Are there any trouble codes set? Is the engine overheating, transmission overheating, transmission slipping? Is there an issue on the vehicle uh, that might be causing the computer not to send a command to the solenoid? So this is, um, so if I go back to uh, normal mode, uh, let's just check if the air conditioning is on on this vehicle. So you can see in normal mode, the command is still zero. So in actual fact, I do need, uh, we just brought this vehicle in here. I do need to go investigate. I need to plug that scanner back in and investigate why the computer is not sending a command to the sunlight. But the advantage of the tool is I confidently now know that it's a problem with the computer command and control system, that it is not a problem with the basic refrigeration circuit or the compressor itself. So with that, let's go ahead and shut the vehicle off and um, we will go back to our presentation. Uh, let's wrap up our session with some uh, service tips. Um, so if you want a compressor to last, hopefully if you're replacing the, the original compressor, I think there's an expectation from you and the customer that this compressor should last the life of the vehicle. And for that to happen, um, you know, you need the proper refrigerant charge, uh, to transport the oil around the system. If you overcharge the system, you run the risk of slugging or liquid locking the compressor. Undercharge it, oil's gonna drop out and now you uh, have a lubrication issue. The correct viscosity, uh, the correct type, you know, is it mineral or PAG or hybrid electric, the correct type of oil, the correct viscosity of oil, and the correct amount of oil. 20 years ago, the average system charge amount of oil was about eight ounces. Today, if you look up the charge amounts for oil today, a lot of vehicles today are between three and four ounces. It's just a thimble full of oil. So that oil better be good oil, better be going in the right place and so on. So lubrication, pretty important for compressor longevity. And that kind of brings me into, you know, I go into a lot of shops. I get called out to look at uh, problem vehicles from time to time. I go into a shop and I often see that they may be using some kind of a um, ester universal oil, like a, a, a 100 viscosity universal oil. Um, as you know, you know from engine experience that uh, there's a tremendous amount of science and development goes into the development of refrigerant oils. Uh, they're end capped, meaning the molecule is end capped, meaning it will keep microscopic amounts of uh, moisture in suspension to prevent the buildup of acid and corrosion of the system. They'll have anti-wear additives to prevent the, that little smoky particulate that you see building up in, in, in an older system. Antioxidants and metal passivators to prevent acid and all kinds of corrosion buildup in the system. They also have anti-foaming agents. Think about it, if you walk out to a vehicle in a hot summer day and it hasn't been running for several hours, the static pressure in the system is probably, depending on the temperature, 70, 80, 90, even 100 PSI, just a static pressure throughout the system. Well, if you start that engine up and the compressor comes on, the pressure in the crankcase goes from 90 PSI to 30, 40 PSI in a few seconds. Well, it's like taking the cap off a radiator on a hot summer day. When you take the pressure off the oil in the crankcase, it can literally explode. It foams up and that can interfere with the operation of the, uh, the electronic control variable displacement solenoid that you can see there on the rear head of the compressor. It can wash down the lubricating film from the moving parts inside the compressor. Um, I can't overemphasize the importance of choosing a quality oil, very important. And so evacuation, you know, the reason that you pull an evacuation by reducing the pressure on the moisture in the system, it will boil at a lower temperature. And I see, you know, I, this is a, this is a, uh, the picture there is a, a vacuum pump that we use here at our training center for just one season and for an experiment, and you can see, look at the, the, the grunge and the grunge that is developed inside the crankcase of that uh, vacuum pump in just one season. And so this is why, you know, oil, the vacuum pump oil is what creates the seal that enables you to pull a deep vacuum. So it's very important that you change the vacuum pump oil. Couplings are, you know, they, they get in connected and disconnected hundreds of times a season, they're a common source of leaks, little micro leaks that prevent you from pulling a deep, uh, a deep vacuum on the system. Now, um, another, uh, you know, just speaking of vacuum, um, uh, you can see in these three pictures here, 
I'm using, uh, you can see that I've got a conventional set of a manifold gauge set connected up to this vehicle and teed in, in series with the low side line, I've got a micron vacuum gauge. That yellow gauge there is a micron vacuum gauge. And I think you can see, uh, just looking at it, the, the low side gauge, the, the regular blue manifold gauge set, looks like the needless pin to 30 inches, right? And you can see that the, um, the, the micron gauge is at about 920 microns. Now, ideal textbook vacuum on a deep vacuum system would be about 500 microns or less, but I'll take, for this conversation, let's go with 920. After 10 minutes, you can see that the micron uh, level is 24,000. It's gone from 900 to 24,000, but look at the blue gauge. It's still, the needle is still pinned. It looks like it's pulling. You know, if you're just looking at a conventional gauge, it looks like it still has excellent vacuum. Then over here on the right-hand side, the blue gauge still appears to indicate excellent vacuum, but the micron vacuum gauge, which won't start to read until you get to about 28 and a half inches of vacuum, has actually stopped reading altogether. And the takeaway from this is using a micron vacuum gauge is a much more accurate way of confirming and validating that your the vacuum pump is getting down to the deep vacuum that you need to remove all moisture from the system, especially in hot, humid areas you know, where you've got very high humidity. Um, and this is an experiment we do here when we do hands-on class at our training center. I'm sliding a piece of cardboard down in front of the radiator behind the condenser, in other words, blocking airflow through the condenser. And you can see here that in about 20 seconds, high side pressure went from about 220 PSI to, over, no, to almost 450 PSI. And the takeaway here, look at the black line represents engine coolant temperature. This is, this, this is the data right off the right, exported right from the scan tool. You can see engine temperature didn't change at all. In fact, it went down a couple of degrees when we took the heat out of the condenser off the radiator, but high side pressure literally doubled. And the takeaway here is, is it is, you know, if you have a marginal system or a system that's not blowing as cold as it should, or maybe the high side pressure is higher than you would expect it to be, it's very important to look at condenser airflow. Check the voltage, put a voltmeter with the clutch and gauge, put a voltmeter across the compressor and check that you're within a volt of system voltage. Uh, there's an old Ford circuit, uh, AC clutch circuit here. Study this circuit, ignition switch, mode switch, cycling switch, high side cutout switch. There's four switches here to get a potential voltage drop across. And, you know, just to cut to the chase here, by Ohm's law math, one ohm of extra resistance anywhere in this circuit will reduce the wattage of the clutch from 48 watts to 27 watts. Why does that matter? Well, watts is really, watts is a measure of electrical energy. It's really, if you think about it in this case, it's really a measure of the strength of the magnetic field holding the clutch engaged. So one ohm of resistance is gonna almost have the strength of the magnetic clutch engaged. Now I emphasize this point because oftentimes when you're working on the vehicle, you may be doing it <coughs> inside the shop. Um, keep in mind here that about 60% of the heat load entering a cabin on a hot summer day comes from the radiant, you know, the rays of the sun streaming through the windshield. So if you're working on the vehicle inside the shop, um, you know, you're missing over half the normal heat load in the system. So the problem occurs, of course, going back to the voltage drop check, um, is if the, when the customer is inching along and stop go traffic the next afternoon, uh, pavement temperatures, you know, it's a 100 degree day, pavement temperatures 120 degrees, and they're inching along stop go traffic, that's when that weak clutch is going to start slipping, and now the thing is going to come back with the clutch all burned up. You think you have a high set pressure issue when the real problem is there's not enough voltage at the clutch to keep it engaged when the pressure gets really high. So just keep that, always check voltage at the clutch. Same thing goes for cooling fans. In this particular example here, I'm using an infrared tachometer to measure the cooling fan speed. You can see the little white strip there on the back of the fan blade. One point, a 1 1.7 volt drop uh, on the cooling fan circuit resulted in a 12% drop in fan speed, a drop by 268 RPM, and high side pressure went up by 25 PSI. Again, a simple voltage drop check at the cooling fan would have picked up that it wasn't getting enough 
voltage. And as I often say when we do hands-on classes here at our training center, you know, it's the little things. It's the airflow through the condenser, good voltage at the clutch, proper voltage at your, at your cooling fans. It's the little things that add up to ice cold air. Little things uh, make up a lot. Don't forget that the um, the the Schrader valve with the service cap uh, is actually the final seal on the system. Uh, generally, uh, most air conditioning pro shops, as soon as they recover the refrigerant before they even go to evacuate, they replace the Schrader valve because I'm sure you've had the experience. I certainly have where you put the whole system back together and you charge it and you disconnect the coupling and you're about to put the service cap on there only to find that the Schrader port is uh, leaking. So it's just good practice to replace the Schrader valves as soon as you recover the refrigerant from the system. <clears throat> Um, another quick point here, you know, most owners, most drivers operate the blower inside the cabin on usually be on speeds one, two, three, you know, one through three. On the infrared picture on the right here, you can see that is the temperature of the actual blower motor resistor. And so at low speeds, the blower motor is doing the lion's share of the electrical work. In other words, all that wattage we talked about a moment ago is being dissipated in the blower motor resistor. And that's what usually results in the, the blower resistor, the resistor itself, it, you know, burned wires in the blower motor circuit. You've all seen this pretty common. And usually, uh, oftentimes, the cause of repeat blower motor resistor failure or repeat uh, connector burning in the blower motor circuit is excessive blower motor current draw. The blower motor still works, but it's drawing too much current, and that's what's causing the repeat uh, circuit failures in the blower motor circuit. So as a routine, if you have burning in the blower motor circuit, repeat resistor failure if the resistor is failed in the first place, always check the blower motor current. Uh, it, it may be a problem with the blower motor that's causing the repeat failure. Change the cabin air filter, new, you know, $2,000 air conditioning job uh, is still not going to give satisfactory air conditioning performance if the cabin air filter is clogged, like you can see in the picture here. Um, a quick check here. Uh, as a routine, I like to do perform, even if I haven't replaced them, if just as part of an air conditioning job, uh, and especially if a customer complains of intermittent air conditioning performance, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, um, uh, always do an air door actuator recalibration. And the reason for that is if you look here at the red pattern is the current, is the current flow in an actuator circuit while we're doing a recalibration procedure. And do you see in the top on the left of the high part of the red waveform, the motor is stalled for almost five seconds. In the, on the lower right there, that long flat section of the red pattern, the motor is stalled, it's, if you like, brake torqued for 12 seconds. And that's part of the recalibration process. So by doing a recalibration, it's, I find it very effective for picking up on intermittent electrical issues with the air door actuator motors or the circuits. Oftentimes, it'll set a trouble code because the motor is being forced to travel throughout its entire uh, its entire travel range. And so, um, you know, if there's a problem with the motor or with the position sensor in the motor, oftentimes performing the recalibration uh, will flush out the intermittent issue with the, uh, with the motor. Don't forget, look at the past and future, NapaEcklin.com forward slash tech talk. You will see this uh, recording posted eventually. And of course, um, uh, you can look at old ones and register for upcoming Napa Action Tech Talks if there are any scheduled. And if you have, as you go about your summer season, if you have a, an issue, uh, either an application issue, maybe you have a, an old thermal expansion valve, especially if it's off-road, like a tractor, old truck or something of that nature, if you're trying to match up a part or you can't find the part by application, if you call our technical hotline here at 866-502-0068, uh, they will often be able to help you uh, with the catalog lookup issue. Also, they, uh, they will provide technical assistance. So if you have a system, you've replaced the compressor, let's say, or it's not blowing as cold as it should, or some other issue with the air conditioning, they get thousands of calls over the course of the summer. Uh, they may very well, before you stop talking, they may very well have a sense 
of what the problem is with your vehicle. So always, it's a free call, always worth a shot. And by using that PIN number there, 59017, hot summer weather, we often are backed up and you might have to wait for callback. By using the 59017 PIN number, that will give you priority in the queue. So they will, you may get the call answered live, or you will certainly get a faster callback by using that uh, Napa Eklund, um, the Napa Temp uh, personal PIN number. Folks, that is it for today. Thank you very much for spending uh, this Napa Tech Talk session with us and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.